15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts. It's all about astronomy, space science, and you name it, all sorts of amazing things. And we've got a jam-packed program for you today. We'll do an update on the James Webb Telescope. Things are going well at the moment. Uh, systems are nominal. Uh, we're also going to look at the mystery of a dimming star. Now, quite often you can figure that out because something gets in the way, but this one is proving a little bit hard to define. So we'll look into that. And size doesn't matter. Yes, you heard it first, size doesn't matter. Space nuts can make that an absolute. Uh, we're talking about when it comes to a, an extinction level event, like something big, rock-like hitting Earth. Apparently the size of the rock is not the issue and we'll explain why, it's a fascinating story. Plus a couple of questions. We're going to uh, look at uh, a question from Nick about Proxima Centauri and Alex uh, wants to talk about um, detecting big rocks that hit planets and destroy them uh, in light of the uh, the new movie called Don't Look Up, which I actually watched a few days ago. So I'm um, looking forward to talking about that. And we've been sent a joke. So we'll, um, we'll finish the program on that and that'll be the end of us because I don't think any, anyone will tune in ever again. Uh, well, this, program is is Andrew a, this program is a joke, Andrew. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> This program is a joke. <laughs> Everybody knows that. I don't know who that was. My name is Andrew Dunkley, and as always, joining me is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Uh, 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 interrupter in chief. Sorry about that. You were just about <laughs> to introduce yourself. Anyway, never mind. Uh, we know who you are. Um, uh, yes, I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I, I am well. I am well. Because, um, <laughs> just ignoring the, uh, the news headlines that just popped up showing that over 50,000 people in New South Wales and Victoria alone have now been proved uh, to have uh, COVID. Um, we'll just we'll just not bother with that for the moment mm -hmm. and get nope. on with our Sounds lives. Good. Indeed, we should. Mm. <laughs> now, Fred, let's just uh, kick straight into our first story, and that is an update on the James Webb Telescope. Uh, it is all good news so far. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's there has been progress. Uh, the latest we have is that all is going well. In fact, um, the technical description, uh, which comes from uh, one of the lead engineers at Northrop Grumman, that's the prime contractor for the telescope, the technical description is that everything is hunky dory. <laughs> uh, there you are. So that's it. Uh, and um, th there were issues, though, Andrew. I don't know whether you caught up with this. There was um, an issue uh, with the sun shield now the sun shield is a critical part mm. of the uh, of the telescope because without it, it it fails it doesn't work uh, it's this tennis court sized set of screens that have to be deployed and they they deployed um perfectly well um but the opening unfolding them <clears throat> excuse me unfurling them is only part of the story then they've got to be stretched tight across their sort of framework yeah um and the there was a glitch in that because apparently um some of the motors that were involved with that were overheating six of them apparently um and that uh was seen as there wasn't a problem with it but that was seen as a you know a potential issue so they turned the telescope to stop the sunlight falling on these motors and the motors cooled down and the, the the kind of tightening up of the sun shield or securing it as it's called which is apparently a three-day process that <clears throat> that continued and i think that finishes today um and maybe maybe tomorrow us maybe tomorrow australian time anyway it's it's very very much the, the kind of time frame that we're we're doing this podcast in so that's uh, uh and but uh, you know everything's checking out okay as you said all the systems are nominal um the uh there is a nice quote as well from bill ox who's um, project manager uh he said um the best thing for operations is boring and that's what we anticipate over the next three days is to be boring um they 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 they, they don't want anything going wrong which causes excitement boring is good in missions like this where you're trying to yeah um, 
set the thing up and they they do uh the the reports i've read suggest that the that um <clears throat> the, the, the mission controllers might actually start unfurling or unfolding the mirror uh, as soon as this weekend uh the the 18 um, segments of the mirror not all of them have to move actually quite a few of them are already in position mm. but the the outer regions of the mirror have to be unfolded and of course then you've got to make sure that the these segments all align with optical per perfection because it's got to replicate a single mirror that, that of diameter 6.5 meters or 21 feet it's been so, a remarkable so effort so far i must say <clears throat> and uh they um i know i know there were delays and delays but they had to get it perfectly right because as you and i have discussed uh once it's there and if something goes wrong they cannot fix it so yep. uh, everything has to work perfectly and and we you talk about a critical thing like unfurling the mirror but everything they do is critical in this process and you've got to give them a big uh, tick for being able to come up with a solution to the overheating motor problem just swing the thing yeah. around away from the sun cool them down unfurl it swing it back all yep. solved yeah yeah Brilliant. That's right. well that's that's the sort of resourcefulness that you expect from from these things um so yes you're right it's uh, on its way to its destination the l2 point lagrange second lagrange point 1.6 million kilometers or a million miles beyond earth and and i've been guilty andrew of um of oversimplifying the reason why it's going there mm. um, and in fact i've i've said the wrong thing oh. in, in some past conversations because what i said was that uh the the um telescope is in the, the earth's shadow and that's not the case uh, because at that distance the earth's shadow is not big enough to cover the sun uh, so what it is the reason why it's gone to l2 that lagrange point is it, it's all about the thermal you know the heat flow on the telescope and things of that sort uh, but this it, it's a odd thing uh, you've got this imaginary point in space where gravity essentially is nulled um, but you can orbit around that uh, you can actually put something in an orbit around this this imaginary gravity null point mm. um, and, and that's what's happened with other spacecraft like Gaia and, um, and um, I think the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe was also at the L2 point but you, you, so you can do that um, you can orbit around this point uh, which is what the James Webb Space Telescope will do but the reason for doing that is because from that position you've got a very very stable and constant heat load on the telescope you're not in the shadow of the earth you're still in sunlight but it's constant it's not changing as you orbit around the earth as, as it would um you, basically because you you know you, you you're you, you you're going in an orbit that is parallel with the earth's orbit um and takes you around in more or less the same well in the same time as the earth goes around uh so you've always got this constant direction and distance to the sun and that gives the telescopes to operators a stability which is what you need to operate an infrared telescope of such exquisite sensitivity yeah i did actually see an animation the other day of the um the way the james webb telescope will behave the way it will move uh, when okay. it gets to l2 yeah it's yes that's right yeah. it Holy is story. that's right yeah there's a bit of uh it's almost like three point turns things of that sort in the yes in the orbital trajectory yes that's correct amazing anyway um, right. i do apologize for um, misleading comments i may have made on space nuts in the past um all good and well fred let's <laughs> um let's move on to this little mystery because we'll have more to talk about uh, uh, this year as things develop with james webb but uh, this little mystery is about a star that uh, has been dimming and quite often in fact most of the time they can say ah oh, yes we know why that's happening um this that or the other has occurred this one's proving to be a little bit more complex it is uh it's it, this is something that it's an object that was detected by the tess uh satellite uh oh, tess is the transiting exoplanet survey satellite uh a nasa mission that has been finding exoplanets and very good at it good at it too so it is one of the objects detected by tess it's quite a long way away it's 2300 light years away um, and so its light varies which is what tess is all about it's all about detecting this variation of of light and particularly as a, as a planet passes in front 
of its parent star. Uh, but what they've discovered is for this object, and I've got to tell you its name, Andrew. It's oh, yeah. T TIC 4007992424. Okay. That's, yeah, <laughs> don't forget that. I, I um, already have. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a, basically it's, it's, its light was seen to drop uh, by 25%. This, I think, is six years ago when they started observing this thing at first over a period of hours. And then with, you know, s sort of variations in brightness following that. Uh, and um, that was interpreted initially as, as an object that is breaking up. Uh, or releasing dust because we've seen those things before we've seen things that look like planets but are actually objects that are in the process of breaking up so they obscure the light from a star but they just gradually um, you know they gradually dissipate uh, mm. the star formula has a, an object like that orbiting around it a bright star uh, so um, they've what they've done is they've now got six years of data on this object and they can fi they find that it's not really as simple as that um, and there's a number of complicating factors. One is that this star is not a single star. It's actually a binary star system. So uh, it's two, you know, two stars in orbit around one another, and that complicates things. But one of them is, is also a pulsating star, oh. which complicates it even further uh, with a 19.77 day uh, period. And that's, uh, you know, a strong level of periodicity. Um, but whatever it is that's dimming the light on top of all that is uh, is something that is apparently quite erratic. That's the word that's used in the report I read, which comes from uh, Science Alert. Uh, the erratic uh, behavior of this light um, and it, it, it actually um, suggests that that is perhaps an orbiting object that's emitting clouds of dust but the reason why this is still a puzzle, Andrew, uh, and I should say this work's been done at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The reason why that's still a puzzle is that it's huge quantities of dust that are being uh, emitted uh, to, to cause this dimming of the light. Mm. And if it was just a body itself that's falling to bits, like, for example, um, you know, um, one of the asteroids of our solar system doing that, it, it, it would it would not be emitting the same quantities of dust for six years uh, because it would have a short lifespan, uh, probably oh. longer than six years, probably more like thousands of years. But it's still, you know, you would notice uh, that that was changing, that the, um, that, that, you know, that, that if it was, if it was an object that's disintegrating, you'd expect it to dissipate. Uh, and eventually the, the periodic or the quasi periodic dimming would stop. And that's not happening, um, and so uh, there there is a there is a puzzle, um, which is not really easily resolvable because for a start, you don't know which of these two stars in the binary system this object is observing. Uh, sorry, is orbiting, uh, and so you get a different uh, percentage of the of the dimming depending on which star you choose. <clears throat> it, it can be either thirty seven percent. Or seventy-five percent of the light from the from the parent star, depending on which of the two it is, uh, and that's a lot. You know, that's a large amount of obscuration, particularly the, the seventy-five percent. Um, and so, the the most likely explanation that uh, this group from the Harvard Smithsonian uh, Centre for Astrophysics have have uh, evolved is that. Um, some something something around uh, uh you, you know something around going around the star a planet like object it is is colliding with something else mm. uh, as it orbits and re releasing a dust cloud every time it clouds this other object um so that uh, every time it goes around there's there's this this impact between uh, you know, perhaps a planet sized object and an asteroid sized object that releases a new cloud of dust. Um, and that's the only thing that they think fits the bill uh, that it's it's got, you know, the, all the other things that they suggested 
uh, which include, um, you know, disintegration, which we just talked about, the possibility of a dust cloud, which is being shepherded around by um, a, a planet embedded in the protoplanet, uh, protoplanetary disk or the protoplanetary disk itself doing weird things. They've kind of ruled all those things out uh, and just ended up with this idea that maybe there are two objects that are actually colliding. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of these things that will need more and more observations to, to get to the bottom of the story. Mm. Um, when they've found these things in the past, what, what has usually been the cause? Well, there's nothing, there's not been anything quite like this. Ah. Usually it's a much more, you know, you've got <clears throat> something um, where the, the obscuration changes slowly over time and you can envisage that that would be caused by a dust cloud dissipating uh as as you know as it as time goes on <clears throat> if you got dust released from a planetary surface <clears throat> excuse me for example then that cloud might be thick um, and quite dense when it's first released but as it spreads in space it will get more transparent um, that doesn't seem to be happening with this object um mm. th there's the thing is re reasonably bright i haven't got a note of its brightness even though it's quite a long way away so it does raise the possibility of there being more observations made of it um, you know, so from other ob other observatories. I'm going to give this potential reason a name. It's ROC, R-O-C, and I've forgotten what that was going to stand for now that I've defined it. Um, regular orbital collision. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's a ROC. Regular uh, orbit orbital yeah. collision. We, we should send it to the. Uh, should send the it to them and say, "Here, yeah, here's, yeah. here's what you can call it." If it you can call it that, be yeah. that. <laughs> like that, or it could I be. I better um, write it down because I'll forget otherwise. It could be. I should a, record this so that I never forget anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody will. Somebody will. Don't worry. Yeah, about, don't worry. I've about written it anymore. down now. Mm. All right. Well, maybe in a future episode we'll be able to turn around and say, "Well, it turned out to be a rock." A regular orbital collision <laughs> seems to be the right. most likely right. reason. Actually, another one that's a possibility is a dirdis. It could be oh, a what? dirdis. Uh, a, a dirdis, a dusty object erratically dimming its star, which is <laughs> <laughs> which is the title of the, the report that we've seen. Yeah. Well, anyway, that that's too. enough of that. Yeah. yeah. I think rock's better than that. A dirdis is not totally yeah. intuitive. No. My, my, my idea's got a, you know, it's a bit more solid. Oh, a bit more solid, yes. Mm. <laughs> All right. Rock, I'd say rock solid, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. What were we talking about? Can't remember. I have no but idea. <laughs> you are listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Now, if you're into social media, I remind you that we do have an official Facebook page. So if you use Facebook... Uh, jump online and just do a search for Space Nuts. And uh, we've got uh, thousands of people who follow us on the uh, Facebook page. And we publish a lot of uh, material there for you to peruse. Uh, there's also the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook where people talk to each other that listen to the show and share their uh, astronomical photos or ask questions of the audience. And uh, everyone has a crack at answering those. So, um, yeah, we, we're well entrenched in social media. And, of course, we recently joined Instagram as well. So if you're an Instagram user, spacenuts.io is our username there. And we'd be happy for you to follow us on Instagram as well. Now, Fred, to our next story. And this one I love. Size doesn't matter. Now, what we're talking about here is uh, something hitting Earth. Now, in the past, there have been extinction extinction level events where something's uh, hit Earth, and it's happened more than once. We, uh, I suppose, the most famous has been the um, Chicxulub crater asteroid, yep. which which basically was the the end of the dinosaurs. It polished them off. I think they were already on their way out from other studies that have been published, but uh, that's the one that basically did the job and caused a global extinction event. Uh, but we all assume, and it's just a natural thing to think, that it's the size of the rock that hits the Earth that's going to cause an extinction event. So if it's a smaller rock, no big deal. That apparently is wrong. It is. Um, and and, it's, and the, the reason why 
researchers have actually honed in on this to try and <clears throat> to try and understand it is because uh, impacts which we know about from the cratering record on the earth um, there, there are some impacts that you would expect to cause uh, mass extinctions that don't and some that you wouldn't expect to cause mass extinctions that do mm. if all you were looking at uh, was the size um, but actually it, it's it's not that at all uh, clearly size is going to play a part in it because that's the you know the amount of energy that's being put into the rock but something that is um, perhaps just as dominant is what what the meteorite hits what is the rock that it actually collides into on the earth and it turns out that um if if you hit rocks that are rich in um a mineral well a min a mineral rock called potassium feldspar now feldspar is the commonest rock on the planet um huge percentage of the surface crust of the earth is feldspar um and but feldspar comes in different varieties uh, with different elements that are actually bound up in the crystal lattice uh, in different ways giving it different characteristics and they um, the uh, researchers that have done this work um, who are actually based in liverpool in the uk and tenerife in the canary islands uh, what they've identified is the potassium variety of feldspar potassium feldspar if you've got rocks that are rich in that mineral, then you get a mass extinction event. Uh, and that's an extraordinary discovery. It really it is. is an amazing discovery. Um, so uh, it, because it seems so straightforward uh, that the bigger the, the impacting objects, the, the more energy there's going to be and the more damage there's going to be. But there is this other really important constituent. Um, and so, well, let me just quote from uh, one of the authors of this work, uh, Dr. Chris Stevenson, who's University of Liverpool School of Earth, Ocean and Ecological Sciences. He says, for decades, scientists have puzzled over why some meteorites cause mass extinctions and others, even really big ones, don't. It's surprising when we put together the data. Life carried on as normal during the fourth largest impact with a crater diameter of about 48 kilometers, whereas an impact half the size was associated with a mass extinction only 5 million years ago. Many kill mechanisms have been proposed, such as large volcanic eruptions, but just like meteorites, these don't always correlate with mass extinctions. New, using this new method for assessing the mineral content of the meteorite ejector blankets, that's the stuff that comes off when the meteorite hits the surface, uh, we show that every time a meteorite, big or small, hits rocks rich in potassium feldspar, it correlates with a mass extinction event. This opens up, uh, uh, there's a really interesting comment that, uh, that Chris Stevenson makes, this opens up a whole new ave avenue of research. What exactly kills off life? during these episodes and how do the potassium feldspar effects last until now only meteorites that have changed the only meteorites have changed the aerosol regime of the climate and that's the trick apparently andrew with this that uh, it's the fact that um, uh, potassium feldspar causes aerosol or raises aerosols that changes the cloud cover of the planet and actually lets more sunlight uh, fall on the planet and warms it up so what he's saying is just picking up the story from chris until now only meteorites have changed the aerosol re regime of the climate however present day human activities represent a similar mechanism with increasing emissions of mineral aerosols into the atmosphere so a really interesting and fundamental paper that uh, has just come out came out the beginning of last month and um really uh, you know almost rewrites what we know about meteorite impacts would it be possible for us to be able to, okay, we know this is going to hit us. Uh, would they be able to calculate exactly where and then say, oh, that's okay. That's a benign target. We'll let it hit <laughs> Beijing. It's cool. I call it a uh, mass extinction event. Yeah. You, you, well, with enough warning, um, you can predict where an object's going to hit on the earth. And yes, maybe you can predict whether it's going to be rich in uh, potassium 
um, potassium feldspar. It's sometimes, by the way, called K feldspar. K is the chemical symbol for potassium. Mm. Um, but but I think uh, anything like that, you would you would actually uh, you would always take civil defence action, no matter where it was going to hit, because it's all well and good having scientific research results like this, but who knows what might happen in practice? There could be other things that come into play that we don't know about yet. Now, when they say mass extinction event, they don't mean that the whole planet has seen an extinction occur because uh, I think uh, there have been five um, global mass extinction yes, events that's, that's in correct. the history of the Earth that we know of, and only one of them, I believe, was caused by an asteroid, um, and the others were caused by other factors. Um, yes. So are, are these sort of localised effects that we're talking about? Yeah, they, they, they are. They're, they're, they're more... They're, they're not necessarily global effects. Um, so, you, you know, you, you get um, a, a change in the ecology of a whole region, uh, maybe even a whole continent. That's the kind of thing that they're talking about. Mm, okay. So, um, <laughs> so people, people probably don't even think about um, small scale <laughs> events like that. Uh, they, you, know, they, you assume that if something's going to hit the earth, it, it'll be a global catastrophe but uh yeah. i think you and i've talked about certain size rocks and, yes, exactly. and the impact effect and um you know the, uh, the the explosive nature of them and how they could uh, destroy a city or a region or a state or a whole country but not the whole planet so um but th this sort of changes the game because it doesn't it matter does. about the size of the rock it's what it it's what it's yeah. hitting that could be the the, the deciding factor that's exactly right. Um, it's just added a new, really a new layer to the whole issue of, um, <clears throat> of asteroid impacts. It's also increased the odds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Indeed, just, just that's what we right. wanted to know. You, you can all yes. sleep at night knowing that there are a now higher level of opportunities <laughs> for extinction <laughs> for mass events. extinctions, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Well, that, that'll... Um, That'll help. That's a cheerful thing, really. Of course, uh, we, we've got questions coming up um, soon. We answer questions from time to time, but uh, a couple of questions have come in about detection processes and, and and the like, and we've talked about those many times. This is this to, to sort of add a reassuring element to this. These things are heavily monitored, aren't they? Very much so. Yes, they are. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a big, so almost an industry is uh, searching for near Earth near Earth objects. And mm. uh, as we'll talk about when we get to the question, I think we'll say a bit more detail about that then. Yeah. Um, yeah, something else that slipped my mind. I, I was told today I, I had a, a very bad radio shift. I was all thumbs. And <coughs> um, my program director said to me, oh, it's because it's windy. People don't think straight when it's really windy. And I said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and I think it's still <laughs> happening. It's still happening today. <laughs> Yeah, it is very breezy here today, so that may be the reason. But uh, that could be it. It's because yeah. it's windy, Andrew. Don't do space space nuts on a windy day. <laughs> Too late now. Yeah. Too late now. <laughs> Too late. Mm. All right, uh, but that it, it does fascinate me, and uh, um, I, I guess the uh, the final question I have is: Do they know where these pockets of mineral are on the Earth? Has, has that kind of thing been mapped? Yes, I think that the answer is yes. The Earth geology is very, very well known because of partly because of commercial interests. You know, you want to know what's there so that you can see whether you can mine it. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Well, if if an asteroid or a meteorite hit our part of the world, we'd get a lot of gold. <laughs> yes, you would. Yeah. Pretty that'd gold nice, rich region. Yeah. They've just they've actually just found more down the road from us, uh, about 50 mm. kilometres down the road at a town called Wellington. They've just found another um, outcrop, if you like, of gold. So pretty exciting time. All right, um, we will leave it there. Uh, this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.